we're gonna talk about the dangers of the one. And I wanna stop for a moment and just, you know, if you can, close your eyes and think about this. How many of you believe in a soulmate? I know you do. You're listening to my show and I'm all about soulmates. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But if you think about it, it is this age old story that's been told about finding the one, right? Or how about the red string? There's like this, this red string that stretches across all time and space to connect you to, you know, this, the lover that you've had in these other lives and you reconnect. And I love this shit. Like, don't get me wrong. I, this is my shit, right? Or like twin flames, for example. And I'm not making fun of this. I actually really do enjoy things that talk about past lives and love through all the ages. I once saw an astrologer that read my Vedic chart and she told me that Pasha, well, she didn't know Pasha. Here's how it played out. She's like, do you know any Pisces? I said, yes, I do. And I didn't say this, but Pasha's a Pisces. And she was like, this is so interesting. There is a Pisces right next to Aquarius, only one degree apart in your marriage house for this lifetime you will most likely marry a Pisces. And I said, well, my husband is a Pisces. And she was like, this is incredible. I've never read someone. This woman is in her eighties, by the way, Terry Z. She's an astrologer. She lives in Arizona. She said, I, I've never read a married couple who, who their two signs were so close together in the marriage house. They were practically right on top of each other. Aquarius and Pisces right there, right next to each other. So you want to talk about soulmates? There we go. And then if you've listened to one of the most recent recent episodes with Lauren, my other love, she is also a Pisces. Not only is she a Pisces, but they were born on the same day. So they are twin flames, right? They're like twin babies, I think eight, eight years apart or something like that. And so I have the two greatest loves of my life in my marriage house. Like this is totally meant to be. So I'm not saying that don't look for what's meant to be. I'm not saying that don't find your person, the one who you're most aligned with. I think it's hella importante to find your person, to be with somebody that's most aligned in your life, that's going to push you and help you grow, right? The one isn't so bad. The one isn't dangerous on its own. What happens is when the one becomes your everything. That's where we go wrong. It's really a picture that's been painted by society. I mean, when you're a kid, think about every Disney movie. The one is going to come and rescue you, my prince, right? And if you're a little girl, you're like talking about this stuff in the hallways at school and you grow up and, you know, maybe your mom if you're a woman and, and maybe young boys too, but your parents were like, wait for the one wait for the right time. I know my mom did that. Shout out mom. She was trying to protect me and keep me safe. But I thought like I wasn't going to have sex until I knew it was the one. My poor high school boyfriend, Kent, I think waited like three and a half years before I would like actually have sex with him because I was like, you know, waiting for the one. And then you grow up and everything's about the one. So much pressure. I mean, such big shoes to fill. I mean, we grow up and we're trying to sort of see if every single person that we date can fit into this idea of the one so that we can make them our everything. Isn't that a lot of pressure? I was recently talking to friends of mine, a couple. I was talking about this with them and they were like, well, Jess, your, your partner should be your everything. You should be able to go to them for, you know, counsel, for comfort. You should be able to Go to them when you have a problem at work and you need to vent about it and you need to talk through something when you're having trouble with your family. If someone passes away, they should be the one that you go to for support. They should be the one to start a business with. Isn't that amazing? Starting a business with your, your partner. Um, they should be the one to help you raise your kids and help you around the house and go on vacations with and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's like, when you think about that, actually getting all of those needs met from one single person creates so much pressure. 
It's actually like a pressure cooker, at least for me. That's how I felt about it. And I'm not saying that that person can't show up for you in all of those ways. What I'm saying is when you make that person your everything and they make you their everything, it becomes this interesting, tense balance, right? So when you are looking for your person, you are on the track of dating. I, I do not envy anyone who's dating right now who is coming from this mindset because you have a checklist, right? Rather than just dating from like, I'm trying to have amazing experiences and being open to what comes along. But if you are dating and you find the one, guess what happens to a lot of people? They stop trying. They're like, great, check. Or you find the person and they propose, you want to get married. So you're saying yes. And then you have this big wedding. You had this grand thing that you were working towards together and it happens and it's done. Then what? You're like, oh, I could rest. I met the one. I found them. We got married. I have the ring. I wore the dress. We got married in Spain. It's beautiful. And then what? Some people stop trying. Then maybe you want to have kids. Great. Or maybe you want to buy a house. Amazing. So when you have something to work towards, you're actually building momentum together and you have a common goal, which is great. But a lot of people don't orient themselves in this way. They don't create couple goals. So they meet the one and then they rest because it can be exhausting to date and find this person. When you make someone your everything, you can lose yourself in them. This is another major danger of making somebody your everything. Has anyone ever lost themselves? I know that I've lost myself in relationship before. Their hobbies became my hobbies. Their friends became my friends. I dated a guy that was into beer, micro brewing beer. He used to brew it at home. We used to brew it at home. I once waited in line for a special release of some I don't even remember some brewing company in San Diego at five in the morning on a lawn chair to get beer. Do I look like beer? Is that important to me? No. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, wow. Okay. She's so different than the woman that (laughs) runs this podcast. And it's true. I've changed and I've evolved so much over the last 10 years, but I want you to think about it. Have you ever tried to fit yourself into being the one for somebody else. It's exhausting. It creates anxiety. And how many of you have tried to make someone the one? You know, I mentioned it earlier, but getting them to really love all the things that you do and go to your classes with you and just like be into everything that you want to do because you want to spend all of your time together, right? This is a major danger of the one when a couple sort of morphs into the same person. Not okay, not fun, not good. Let me tell you why. We need two things in life. Well, we need a lot of things in life, but the the first two things that are basic human needs are consistency. And that's what's happening. You know, when you're in relationship, you're creating consistency, you're creating security with this person and it's beautiful. But do you know what the other thing that we need is? Variety, novelty, newness, limerence, all of it. Which is why in the beginning, it's so fun. You know, the first two years of a relationship are so hot, heavy, steamy. Do you want to know why? There's mystery, right? There's this beautiful dance. There's this amazing polarity between novelty and variety and mystery and consistency that's happening when we have a new relationship. Um, I've mentioned Esther Perel so many times on this podcast. She is a queen. If you haven't read her books, get them. They will change your life and change your relationships. But she talks about, we need to have mystery because mystery breeds desire. You know, you can't have desire and eroticism if we don't have distance with our partner. So. When you're in the beginning, you have two people that don't know a lot about each other and you're getting to share it and you're getting to know somebody, which is really fun because as you're getting to know them, you're creating that sense of security, 
and you're creating that fulfillment and that coziness as things start to like settle in and feel really nice. You could like be on sweatpants and the couch six months in and you know, you, you feel comfortable, but there's still so much you don't know about this person. And it's exciting. Do you know what's sexy? Two people who are discovering each other. And if you think about making someone the one and having them be your everything and spending all your time together, doing all of these things together all the time, having all the same friends, going on all the same trips, maybe even working from home in the same space, you will lose all of the mystery. It's not sexy to know every single thing about a person. Let me tell you, you know, Pasha and I have, have done this dance and we got to realize this early on. And that's why I wanted to share this with you all, because I feel like this is one of the things that we do really well, you know? So this episode, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Um, it has a second part and I'm going to sit down and record this second part to this episode. And I think you guys will really love it because the main way I've become accustomed to staying out of this sort of pitfall of the one, right? This little trap, this little societal construct that was literally handed down to us from generations trying to keep property and religion happy. Um, and then of course, in our capitalistic society, when there's marketing and Disney movies and Tiffany's, you know, and everything is the one, the right ring, the right person, the right guy, like the ring is almost more important than the guy. Sometimes it can be so much. And I want to give you this roadmap to navigate. So the best way that I know how to stay out of this trap is called discovery mode. And it's where you are in the first two years of your relationship. You are totally in discovery mode, right? You are discovering them. They're discovering you. It feels so good to be discovered really to like, to, to leave little sort of breadcrumb information about who you are and what you like and to be witnessed in all of that. It's very powerful. In this next episode, I'm going to share with you the three ways to stay in discovery mode in your relationship, no matter if you've been dating for two years or 10 or 30. It doesn't matter if you're monogamous or polyamorous. Staying in discovery mode is really where it's at, you guys. And so stay tuned. I cannot wait to share this one with you.